Today's session is entitled An Overview on Invasive Forest Pests and Diseases, and it is presented by Jody Ellis. Jody is the Exotic Insects Education Coordinator at Purdue and has been educating the public about such forest pests as emerald ash borer and the gypsy moth for more than 10 years. As you can see on the screen, we are offering continuing education credits for this session, and we will give you specifics as to how you acquire those credits at the end of the presentation. This presentation is being recorded, and it will be available for viewing later today. So what you'll need to do is go to www.emeraldashborer.info, which is all one word, and find the URL for today's recorded webinar. There will also be a document available with more information on the pests and diseases that Jody is discussing today. I'd like to thank you for your interest today, and please feel free to email me with your thoughts about today's presentation. The contact information is available on the notes pod that is underneath the chat pod. Today, um, what we will do is if you have questions, please feel free to use the chat pod. Uh, type in your questions. We're going to let Jody pretty much proceed with her presentations, and then we will be answering the questions after she's finished with her presentation today. We always like to hear uh, if you enjoy these sessions and if they're useful. So please feel free to let us know. And with that, Jody, I'm going to bring up your presentation, and we will go from there. Great, Robin. Can you hear me okay? Hello, everybody. Uh, am, uh, everyone's hearing me? That's fantastic. Well, thank you all for hopping on today. I'm really excited to do this presentation. Um, I had the last two days sitting at home. Uh, Purdue actually closed for two days from the storm, which is pretty unprecedented, or at least very unusual. So um, I had some time to really read a lot about these invasive species I'm going to talk about today. You'll notice an, an absence of one in particular, and I'll bet you can guess which one that is. That's emerald ash borer. Because I thought it'd be interesting to uh, look at some of the other invasive pest concerns that affect forests in North America that are out there. I'm not pretending to be an expert on all of them. I'm certainly not. Um, but I thought it'd be uh, entertaining and fun to see, well, maybe fun isn't the word, but to see what's out there uh, and what's coming up. So with that, we're going to proceed. And OK, let me get started. There we go. I, I just thought, I, you know, we talk about invasive species so much that, that I think it's a, a good thing to uh, be reminded of exactly how important invasive species are in this world, especially with our struggling economy, they do create a lot of problems, a lot of economic problems, a lot of environmental problems, and a lot of personal problems for uh, people who are directly affected by them. But I ran across a figure when I was working for another presentation that impressed me a lot. And that was that uh, this, this figure that's listed here, the worldwide you can attribute about 5% of the world's GNP to dealing with invasive species. And, and when you think about um, just how much money that is, that's $1.4 trillion, probably more by now. That is pretty impressive. So it's important for all of us to kind of know what's out there. And, and um, so I hope you'll, you'll enjoy this presentation. And off we go. Yeah, uh, first thing I'll, I'll mention, uh, uh, it's very hard to get an estimate of environmental, environmental damage from invasive forest pests. However, uh, I did find this figure that about the uh, forest industry, the forest product industry in the US, and it's kind of staggering. We lose almost a tenth of our forest products to uh, just pathogens alone. Not This doesn't include uh, insects or animals or anything else, but just pathogens alone. About $7 billion of that industry are lost to pathogens. So um, <clears throat> just we will talk about a couple pathogens at the end of the presentation. We're going The way this is structured, we're going to talk about insects first, and then a couple of pathogens that are on the horizon. Whoop, I keep forgetting I need to click. There we go. 
Who's infected? Or who's infected? Well, we know who's infected by invasive species. Who's affected by invasive species? Of course, as I just said, the private landowners, state governments, timber and horticulture related businesses, um, homeowners, municipalities, recreationists, related business utility companies. Future generations are also affected by what we do now with invasive species. And I think that last one is, is in reality um, uh, the, the one that concerns me the most. Because let's face it, folks, we are losing North American forests to these organisms. Now, one of the documents that I reference uh, in this first part of the presentation is a really nice one that was done recently by a group of scientists who were looking at the spread of uh, invasive forest pests in the continental U.S. And, and uh, as Robin mentioned, I put together a, a uh, list of resources that you're going to be able to access online. There's a PDF that you can access online. I suggest you read this. It's fascinating and it has a lot of good information that this uh, the PDF address will be provided for you on the emerald-ash-4.info site after this presentation is finished but you'll hear a little bit about it as we go through. As of right now there are more than 400 uh, invasive insects and diseases that are permanently established in North American forests and I'm sorry to say that more are coming uh, every day well, hopefully not every day, but more are coming frequently. Uh, they damage our ecosystems. They, uh, you can see at the top picture there, those are dying oak trees from sudden oak death in, in California. And then the, uh, all, a lot of pine species, of course, and, and fir species and are being attacked by various organisms. This happens to be a shot of Fraser fir in North Carolina. That's uh, something that I find extremely interesting for myself because I normally work with uh, the eastern forests, which are mainly hardwoods, so this was very illuminating for me. Oh, I see that uh, Robin says that document I was talking about is available right now on emerald-ashboard.info. What a handy site that is. Okay. Uh, more than 400 insects that are native to Europe alone, not Asia, but just Europe, now feed in North American forests. And, uh, of course, as trade increases, uh, every year it gets bigger and bigger. And one of the places we do a lot of trade with, of course, is Asia. Uh, this introduction of, of forest pests has been accelerating. Hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. 14% of, of the established or non-indigenous insects are considered to be high impact species. And what I mean by high impact is that they are regulated, they're making noticeable uh, damage to our North American forests. So if you see me refer to high impact, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, between 1860 and 2006, uh, half, well, there were one half of an, an insect detected per year, so one every two years. It would, would have been a better way to put that, but anyway. Yeah, and now in the most recent 16-year period, and this is, this is from that article I was talking about, uh, the detection of these high-impact forest pests that I was referring to is increasing to 1.2 per year, and that's, as you can see, that's almost three times the rate that they've been detected in the previous 130 years. The answer to that puzzle is that we are doing a lot of trade that we never did before, and when you do a lot of trade, you're not going to detect everything that's coming in. Unfortunately, of these things detected between 99 and 06, almost half of them fell into the high impact group, so they're getting deadlier, supposedly. And when you consider invasive species, too, you have to think about the compounding factors, of which there are too many to list. But the big ones are climate change, uh, that, which uh, I think we're seeing a little bit of that right now. Acid deposition. Poor forest management has been a big factor in uh, the problem with forest pests. We've had a lot of droughts, too. And there's many, many other compounding factors that add into this, this problem. 
Now one of the other resources that I use that's available to you is a wonderful site called the Pest Trackers and that's done by NAPIS which is the National Agricultural Pest Information System and almost all of the maps that I use in this presentation today were pulled directly off the NAPIS website which I, strangely is posted at Purdue, but that's kind of incidental. This NAPA site, I, if you're interested in where the distribution of any kind of invasive forest pest or organism or plant or anything else is, please go to this site. Once again, this web address will be available to you on the, the document after this presentation. We're going to start off with insects, and as I said, the one you won't see much of on here is, is our friend, the emerald ash borer. Um, I will go ahead and show you the most recent map, which is actually just from uh, February 1st. So if you haven't seen this map yet, look at your state, and you can see uh, that, uh, that area, that circle around Detroit, about 100, 200 miles out, is filling in pretty solid. But uh, we are certainly picking up detections here and there, uh, even further out from that. So. Uh, if you haven't seen it, there's your there's your warm up, there's your appetizer for today. I thought it'd be fun to uh, thinking about emerald ash borer. Let's talk about one of its cousins that is um, actually out on the west coast. This is the gold spotted oak borer, and I've seen it golden spotted oak borer. I've even seen gold oak borer, but I believe it is gold spotted oak borer is the correct name. It's also an agrilus beetle, just like emerald ash borer. And it is a, a native uh, to the south. It's native to Mexico and Guatemala, and there's, there uh, is a species of it that's very similar that I believe was detected out in Arizona. Uh, southeastern Arizona is uh, native to the oak forest there. But because we are moving firewood around and things like that, this thing has actually been found in uh, California recently. And, and it is a devastating pest of the uh, the various types of oak in California, the coast live, the black oak, and the canyon live oak. And it was uh, first really noticed back in 2008. It is It acts very similarly to emerald ash borer in that it, it makes the D-shaped holes. Um, the life cycle is very similar. Of course, this is a, a, a lot warmer climate, but it has established very, very well on, along the coast in California and, and has actually, if you've ever been to the Cleveland National Forest down there in Southern California, uh, it has so far been implicated in the death of 10% of the coast live oak and black oak trees on the, the Mexican, California-Mexican border. So this is one to watch, and, and what makes it so devastating, just like emerald ash borer, this thing is easily transported in firewood, and, and it's speculated that it was brought to California, uh, perhaps from Mexico, by someone bringing loads of firewood up. And, and I, I'm, we're seeing kind of, this thing could be the Western version of emerald ash borer. I hope that's not true, but it's it's pretty grim out there. This is a, a map of detections where they've looked for it. Uh, of course, it's it's been looked for very very much in California along the coast, and so far, it's only been found down there in the far southwest corner of California. Uh, it looks like they've also looked for it out in Massachusetts, which I think is interesting, and I really have no explanation for that except. They're pretty good out there in Massachusetts at looking for these things. It, it uh, obviously is an uh, insect that is more uh, adapted to warmer climes, but with climate change and all, we may see its range expand, and we don't want something like this attacking oak in the rest of the country. We don't want it attacking in California either, but, but uh, this is something that's on the horizon. I thought we'd switch a little bit. I'm sure most of you in the East anyway, and, and the West too, are familiar with European gypsy moth, and, and that's actually what my, I cut my teeth on for invasive species. Uh, it is pretty widespread. Uh, you probably, I won't bore you with all the details. It's pretty devastating. Feeds on over 500 types of plants, but it really, really loves oak. So it's a big problem here in Indiana and a huge problem on the East Coast. And one thing that does help keep it in check a little bit is that there are populations of, of, uh, of 
anything from diseases to natural enemies that do help knock the populations down, but they do go in an outbreak cycle. Just about every 10 years we have a, a, a huge outbreak and that's when we lose a lot of forest trees. One thing that also helps is that the females do not fly, so dispersal is, is only done by, by the uh, ballooning caterpillars. So keep that in mind when we talk about the next pest too. This is a, actually one of our success stories. It's a target of the U.S. Forest Service Slow the Spread program, um, which I'm very familiar with because we participate in that in here in Indiana. But uh, with strategic placement of treat, or treats, treatments, uh, we've been able to hold this thing, at least slow it spread down, just like the program says. Uh, this is a, uh, I like this map. This one is a kind of a compilation of all the surveys and all the places that it has been uh, looked at through time since we started doing uh, surveys for, for gypsy moth. And uh, you can see that it's been found in a lot of places. The, the thing that's really nice about European gypsy moth, however, is that once you find it, if it's a, an outlying population, it's not really that hard to knock back with the right treatments. Of course, as, as our uh, uh, budgets shrink, this may become more of a problem. But you can also, if you look at the northeast all the way to Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, it's uh, Indiana, Kentucky, there is a solid mass of where it is generally infested. So uh, that that general clump of things will continue to move. Our hope is to keep it completely slowed down and, and help preserve some of those oak forests that are out there. Now, we have a cousin of European gypsy moth that's a, a, fortunately not really established well here, but in my opinion, this thing is much more frightening than European gypsy moth, and that's for several reasons. It has a broader host range than European gypsy moth and, and even feeds on some evergreens. But uh, one thing about it that's a little different is the, the females of Asian gypsy moth do fly, so their dispersal is quicker and stronger than that of European gypsy moth. It's uh, <clears throat> when it is found in North America, and it's been found, you'll see in a minute, in a few sites in, in the West, it has been successfully eradicated. And that's one good thing about Asian gypsy moth is that it does respond well to treatments. Usually for gypsy moth, so you use uh, Bacillus thuringiensis uh, crustaki uh, to control them with aerial treatments if you have a large enough area. And sometimes you can use the uh, mating disruption with pheromones. Now if you look at this map, you can see that it's been found, poor California just has had a, a terrible time with this kind of stuff, has been found down in that the southwest California. If you look up in Washington and Oregon, they've had a few problems with it, but, but so far this thing has uh, been eradicated uh, when it has been found. And the problem is when you're doing detection for this, it is very difficult to tell it apart from European gypsy moth. It has to be done in a lab. And so it gets a little more expensive and a little more complicated. But because this thing is coming in from the Russian Far East, you have to look at those port cities and uh, keep pace, close attention to where this thing has been. Let's look at another interesting moth that has come along that's becoming a problem in the east. This is the winter moth. And it is a really weird little moth in, in that it is one of the few lepidopterans that, that actually has active adults in, yep, in the winter, which uh, I just think is fascinating. It's a generalist feeder, that, and, and it's not the moths that are feeding, it's the caterpillars in more uh, warmer times, but it's a generalist feeder and it, it likes, it's a big problem with fruit trees and it likes fruit very, very much and I included apples, blueberries, and cherries, but it also attacks, the, uh, the caterpillars also attack um, maple, oak, poor ash trees, birch, elm, linden, and, and crab apples. So it, it has the potential when it is in a huge outbreak to be a major forest pest uh, as well. I just thought I'd throw in a little bit about how this thing operates because I was fascinated with it. 
uh, people out on the East Coast are probably bored with this, but but humorous people in the Midwest who, who don't really see, we have winter moss here uh, of a certain type, but you hardly ever see them. Uh, their strategy is to stay in the ground as pupa uh, after they finish feeding in the summer, and they emerge in the fall, and once again we have wingless females here. They are uh, nocturnal, the males are nocturnal, and, and uh, they've actually been seen flying around Christmas lights at that time of year, which I thought was pretty funny. But um, the mated females, they mate in the wintertime. Uh, the females will go and deposit egg clusters. These, these are very similar. The behavior is similar to gypsy moth. These are actually loopers, uh, looper caterpillars, which is a lot different than gypsy moth. But they, the eggs hatch out in, when it gets warm in the spring, and the caterpillars feed through mid-June. They pupate in the soil, and off we go again. And this has been, these guys have been a problem out in the um, Washington and Oregon areas. At where they've been controlled with BTK and spinosad and have recently become a uh, big problem in the New England states where they've had some uh, very big outbreaks of, of, uh, of winter moth there. So I'm assuming that they're going to uh, start controlling the populations that way. You can see what I was talking about. Washington and Oregon, they have been found out there. Um, but somehow they managed to get all the way across the country to the Massachusetts area and some of the surrounding states, Connecticut, etc. And because they're also an outbreak pest like gypsy moth, they've caused a lot of problems out there. Now we've all heard of Asian longhorn beetle, or I, or I think most of us have, and, and, but it is certainly worth mentioning because it seems to be kind of on the move uh, at the moment. Uh, they are um, Longhorn beetles, they attack hardwood trees, and they have a, a huge host range once again. Uh, they, they do really, really like maple trees, the horse chestnut, the buckeyes, the willows, elm, birches, and sycamore. They were first found in the U.S. Uh, in the, it, out, of, out of a port, meaning that it first found established in the U.S. in New York back in 1996, and since then, They've shown up in other places in New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Massachusetts, and Toronto. Happily, the uh, population in the Chicago, Illinois area was declared eradicated um, back, I think it was in 2008, I believe. If somebody knows, they might want to type it in the chat. I think it was. But anyway, they can, if you get a, a, a citizens and all who are very interested in working with this, you can have a lot of success in controlling it. However, uh, I did mention the in, uh, that they had found this insect in Massachusetts, and, and unfortunately that's in the Worcester area, and I apologize to those of you from Massachusetts if I'm not saying Worcester right. I've been corrected many, many times on that. But um, the, the infestation in the Worcester area had gone undetected for about 10 years, and uh, had killed thousands and thousands of trees. There are thousands of trees removed from uh, ALB. And you've got to wonder if it was undetected for 10 years, where else it's been inadvertently carried to. The, the uh, story reminds me of EAB. I, I hope that eradication efforts uh, that are being undergone by USDA APHIS and, and the states out there are successful. You may not know this, but Asian longhorn beetle is certainly something that's been familiar to us. It reminds me of EAB. I, I hope that eradication efforts uh, that are being undergone by USDA APHIS and, and the states out there are successful. You may not know this, but Asian longhorn beetle is certainly something that's been familiar to us for a long, long time. Uh, infrequently turns up in detections in, in uh, such states as anywhere where there's uh, shipping coming in, California, Florida ports, Illinois, Indiana, Ma uh, Massachusetts, Michigan, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Texas, Washington, and Wisconsin, and then in parts of Canada as well. This is something that these inspectors, like this guy down here, really, really look for. And fortunately, uh, it's, if you know what you're looking for, ALB is easy to see, but you've got to wonder how many, how many of these things aren't detected and go on. Uh, this is not just a, a North America problem. They've been found in Austria, France, Germany, and Italy too. So this could be, soon become a national, a national problem. 
Yeah, ALB management is pretty much the, the big three, prevention, survey and detection, and eradication. They do use pesticides sometimes to control ALB, but, but the strategy up till recently has basically been be, to remove and destroy infested trees, which has, uh, in Worcester anyway, that's been kind of a devastating process, but a necessary one. This is the, uh, once again, this is the all-time record of surveys and finds of, of um, ALB throughout the U.S. and I tried to find one for North America because our, our Canadian neighbors have had their problems with this thing too but unfortunately I couldn't find that in time. But you can see that uh, it's certainly been a problem on the East Coast. You can see that infestation in Chicago, the Chicago area that was declared eradicated. I hope that's true. I'm such a, a, a pessimist, though, because I'm, I'm a, an entomologist, and if there's one thing that insects can do, it's, it's find a way to survive. So I hope I'm wrong about this one, but I don't know. Just uh, because this one is, is of concern to some areas of the country, I did mention the, the um, Japanese cedar longhorn beetle, which is a very relatively, anyway, smaller beetle that does attack uh, it's kind of a nursery pest, and it, it's been found in the U.S. on eastern red cedar nurseries. I'm talking about nurseries in North Carolina, and then American arborvitae in Connecticut. Uh, it it has not, to my knowledge, been established in natural forests. But if it did, if you think about the number of related plants that are out there in a lot of, especially the eastern forests and all, it could be a major component in in disrupting an ecosystem. And not to mention it would be a huge, huge problem for nursery industry. This is another one that's a longhorn beetle that's frankly intercepted at U.S. ports and it, they, when they get shipping material, Japanese cedar is frankly used as, as dunnage and packing material for shipping, so this is one that comes in quite frequently as well. This is, uh, once again, the uh, surveys and finds of Japanese cedar longhorn beetle in the U.S. So you can see the, uh, that it's been established in uh, the southeast corner of Pennsylvania. Um, fortunately, it's not widespread yet, but it certainly is on our radar as something of concern to our forests. Hemlock willi woolly adelgid. Oh, I wish this one wasn't around. I, I have the the sad experience of walking through some forests in Massachusetts where this thing had kind of gone wild and it was ugh, just awful, just devastating and ruins the beauty of those forests. But in case you don't know what an adelgid is, it's, it's kind of like an aphid and it, it, it feeds on sap. It has those funny mouth parts where it pierces down and sucks the sap right out of hemlock trees at the base of the needles is where they attack. It was uh, first seen in the eastern U.S. in 1951 and they have established, although there are, um, it has also been in the west, they've established that this population that was found in Virginia actually originated in southern Japan so it came over um, on some product from Japan. It is a terrible pest of eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock and that those trees are um, uh, they're not exactly prevalent, but there are forests of, of hemlock in, in the eastern U.S. The impact of this particular creature has been most severe in those states, Virginia, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. And uh, control of this thing is exceedingly hard. It's very difficult to control hemlock woolly adelgid with, with uh, uh, any kind of pesticide because it is an adelgid and it's very, very hard to break through those little waxy coats that those guys put on. Uh, so they are testing right now with uh, biological control using some uh, predators, some tiny beetles from Asia that is showing a glimmer of hope. Yeah, once again, you can see that hemlock woolly adelgid really has a foothold uh, in the eastern part of the country, especially look at Pennsylvania and New York and and of course Massachusetts, all those those states in the New England area. Uh, <clears throat> this is yet another one that we certainly don't want to see. The control of hemlock woolly adelgid right now is basically done through uh, mechanical means, cultural means. They do have pesticides that that can help. Some uh, I think it's. I I believe they use imidacloprid on, on those guys, but 
but it's just not uh, very practical in a forest setting. So this is one that, that's threatening hemlock. Cyrex wood wasp. Um, such a cool looking insect. It's a horn tail, if you're familiar with that um, term. And they look, they look very waspish. Uh, they're kind of like that, but they're, they fall into the category of horn tails. They're uh, native to Europe. I believe the infestation that's over here did come from Europe. And they've been, this is once again going to be a global problem, especially in southern hemisphere pine plantations. They've been introduced into New Zealand, Australia, and then uh, Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and South Africa. So I didn't know this, but a lot of those plantations are actually planted with North American species like Monterey and Loblolly pine. And in those um, plantations where this thing has become rampant in the southern hemisphere, it's caused up to 80% tree mortality. So we have a lot of concern about our southern forests here that have a lot of susceptible pine um, species down there. It does attack slash pine, shortleaf, ponderosa, lodgepole, and jack pine, which uh, are common in the south, uh, in the United States anyway. Uh, the way this thing works is pretty interesting. It, uh, it, the female, the, like you see at the top of the page there, and, and then at the, uh, you can see her actually drilling into a tree in that strange picture <laughs> to the left there. Uh, they t use their ovipositors to drill into through the sapwood. And while they're drilling around, getting ready to deposit eggs, they also inject a symbiotic fungus and some mucus, which is actually toxic. And it's the combination of the fungus and the mucus that actually kill the trees. And, and that uh, fungus mucus thing is actually necessary for larval development. You can see the kind of blue staining at the bottom picture there of, uh, of a larva who's uh, apparently looking pretty good, doing quite well in there. Now, one good thing, if you can say it's good about Cyrex, is, is that uh, it is, I'm going to say, relatively easy to control with biological control once you get that biological control stuff established. That's the, that's the key. And the, the control is, is done with nematodes, actually. Um, the nematodes actually infect the larva and, and has the peculiar action of sterilizing the females. As they become adults, they are actually sterile. And um, the nematodes develop in these, these sterile infected females. And as the female flies around and in, injects these infertile eggs, she's actually injecting nematodes in with that. So, so these nematodes are actually mass reared and, and done with U.S. Forest Service. I, I believe it's U.S. Forest Service who's mass rearing them. And, and they are using some inoculation in some places. This insect, by the way, is not regulated um, by our government, but uh, it could be if things get worse. But, but this is certainly a pest to look out for in the southern hemisphere and the southern part of the US. And here's, here's where um, Cyrus Woodbeck wasp has been found. You notice New York has a pretty heavy infestation. It doubtless came in on some kind of port up there somewhere. It's been found in Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, but so far not found in the south. And we're certainly hoping it isn't found in the south. European pine sawfly, probably my favorite invasive species up here because I love uh, sawflies. They are European and they have a, they, the way they feed is kind of weird. They only feed on the older pine needles so it makes a really weird looking plant when they're done with it. They prefer the two needled pines. Um, but they will attack several different pines. And, and um, they, look, they are actually soft lice. So they, although the larva looks like a caterpillar, it's not. It's a soft lie. And the adult resembles a wasp. European pine soft fly is a, a, obviously a problem in Missouri. Has been found in Ohio, New York, um, place, uh, Michigan, a few places, Connecticut. So it has a wider distribution than we would like. And, and uh, once again, we're trying to, to look at places where, where pine of the species we mentioned are a problem. Um, watch out the west, because this thing could be a problem. Now, whoops, hang on a second. The, uh, they use natural controls on European um, 
pine saw fly, uh, there are several parasites in the U.S. that feed on them, rodents, birds, etc. In places where they're a big problem, they, they do use mechanical control by clipping off the branches when that's possible, and they do use some bioirational insecticide spay, sprays, and then if necessary, they can use spot sprays of uh, insecticides. And in the worst case scenario in plantations, etc., they actually do use the, the general uh, sprays of, of insecticides to control this. So there are ways to address it. Here's one that, that uh, we all know and love, the banded elm bark beetle, or uh, my boss calls it the two-tone Chevy. I don't, I don't know why, but anyway, it is a, um, it attacks elm trees, like elm trees don't have enough problems. American, Siberian, English, and rock elm are the ones that it attacks. It, it seems to accompany drought. When you have a, a drought stress forest, this thing really kind of goes crazy. It's native to China, Central Asia, and Russia. First found in the U.S. in uh, 2003 in places in Colorado and Utah. And since then, it's been collected in 21 states. So this is kind of a widespread insect as well. There is some concern that it can uh, vector Dutch elm disease. Just what we need is another beetle doing that. And the, the main way that this is controlled is through sanitation, uh, meaning that uh, the early removal of infested trees is what's recommended. The other thing that, that um, this thing will attack stands that are not managed properly, so proper watering of, of standing elms is something that is recommended. And of course, this all of these things, practically all of them are moved in firewood, so we have to be careful about that. You notice the... the uh, very unique gallery that's a typical bark beetle gallery, that crisscrossy looking stuff. And here once again is, is a, a big overview picture of where banded elm bark beetle has been found. And uh, it certainly is found where I am in Indiana, but look at the west. Look out there at the west, the Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, Idaho areas. This thing is, is a very big factor in forest fires um, as it kills drought stress trees out there. This is a, a very, very serious problem. Southern pine beetle. Once again, I, I like talking about the south because I, I'm wishing I was there right now, to be honest with you. But southern pine beetle is another insect that, that attacks pine and, and uh, uh, it does prefer the southern yellow pine, like loblolly and things like that. There are natural enemies in place for southern pine beetle that do have some effect on it, but these things, once again, have outbreaks, and, and when those outbreaks are occurring, the natural enemies are easily overwhelmed. The best weapon against southern pine beetle is good forest management uh, and sanitation. They definitely prefer ill-managed stands of pine, and uh, this could be a, a, a very devastating problem uh, to the southern forests. Uh, the attack is, once again, it's this, this um, fungal uh, insect compound, and, and it takes two beetles to attack, and, and they, they do have these extensive galleries uh, where the, it, the female is going to feed and deposit eggs, and, and the galleries, as you can see on the bottom picture there, become so um, intense that they crisscross each other and girdle the trees. And you can, I think you can see the blue stain fungus in that bottom picture as well, which also uh, affects tree mortality. And there are a few places where this thing's been found in the south. Once again, the main thing is to manage those stands so that the trees have vigor and health. I did want to mention pathogens. I wish I had more time to, um, to talk about even more things, but, but these are the two pathogens that I think most people are concerned about right now. And the first one, of course, is sudden oak death. And that's one that I chose because it certainly affects uh, all of the U.S. and, and Canada, anywhere where, where nursery stock is moved. It's uh, what... Uh, the, the organism is Phytophthora remorum. The disease is called sudden oak death. But Phytophthora remorum uh, is, is a type of water mold. And water molds are, are strange organisms. And I admit they're, the, uh, they're a little bit beyond me as far as understanding exactly what they are. The origin of Phytophthora remorum at this time is, is unknown. We're not sure how it came over. Um, we're pretty sure it's not native here. 
but how it got over here probably in some type of nursery stock or something like that but but uh, it was noticed um, since the early 1990s in California that that lots of oaks and and uh, their tan oaks out there were dying in in droves out there along the coastal counties um, somebody noticed this and and finally made the connection that uh, Phytophthora remorum could actually infest nursery stock and I'll explain how how this two cycle thing works. It was first reported in 1995 out in California but since then it's been found in, in Oregon as well as California and in some nursery settings in California, Oregon, Washington and British Columbia. Now when uh, when this organism Phytophthora remorum gets going it causes two types of diseases and it depends on what plant you're looking at the first thing on on host trees such as the oak trees we talked about it causes cankers uh, that actually end up killing the host but on ornamental plants uh, rhododendron is the one that that uh, we all think of when we think about this although there are there are others it causes a foliar blight and and we think that Phytophthora remorum in these um, uh, ornamental plants is is in a, a kind of a reservoir stage so people go they buy these in, infected um, plants from a nursery or wherever and they take it home they put it out on their patio and it eventually makes its way to the surrounding uh, urban or, or rural forests and that's what we believe happened in California the spread uh, through within nurseries can be caused by the plant material itself water systems, contaminated irrigation water, windblown rain, it's it's kind of a losing battle because they it is very easily spread and they're also looking at the fact that it might be dispersed by soil and potting mix and potting mixes which takes it back to the nursery again. This is the uh, a picture of the cankers that it causes on uh, oak trees out there it looks like it's bleeding it's actually kind of a red tinge black red tinge thing and and it takes about three to five years for this stuff to kill a tree out there but you can also see on the the ornamental species and I've mentioned rhododendron but there's a list of other ones out in California that that um, have problems it, it causes leaf spot and twig dieback and and you know what if you've ever done a nursery inspection or anything seems like there's a lot of stuff that causes leaf spot and twig dieback so once again when they when they suspect this they have to take it to a lab it gets very expensive and very complicated to do these surveys but but they uh, do them anyway and they have to yeah in the United States it's so far on the oak death out in the forest anyway the sudden oak death syndrome is only known to occur along those in those west coast areas that we talked about but uh, you know you have to consider that that these ornamentals there's huge nurseries in California they ship all over the country and if this pathogen gets into the oaks in the eastern forests we're gonna have a a major major problem so this is something that is regulated and watched very closely now there are the problem when you're surveying uh, for sudden oak death on oak trees in the eastern forest is there's a few things out there that really really kind of look like this and I just thought I'd mention them because they're kind of interesting first is a fungal disease called oak wilt I'm not going to try to pronounce that because I'm terrible at, at fungal species but they attack red oak species and, and they do cause those cankers oak decline is a complex of, of diseases and organisms and all kinds of things that kill mature oaks and you also can see some of those cankers on that and then the red oak borer out on the east part attacks uh, red oaks preferably likes uh, will attack white oaks and and the larval uh, damage causes staining and and you can see that dark moist frass that kind of resembles cankers as well and there is our um, our, our this the surveying for this stuff has been very very intense especially since the finds at California nurseries and all but you can see the that west coast area that we were talking about there I've noticed that there was a, a place in Indiana that shows up as having it and I think that was actually a false thing I, I don't think that that turned out to plan out but you can see where Phytophthora remorum has been detected in some of these eastern areas Georgia um, uh, 
Maryland, etc. So, so this is a very expensive program that really needs to be continued. I also wanted to talk about, in, in closing, the, uh, a new one, uh, new to the East Coast, not new to the West Coast, but Thousand Cankers Disease of Black Walnut, which uh, has been out in the West Coast for a few years. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second, but has recently been found in Tennessee uh, last year. First time it's been found east of the Rocky Mountains. So this is something we're all on the alert for because the, usually there's a lot of black walnut trees in our eastern forests. Uh, they've noticed a lot of decline of, of black walnut out in the western states for so, about 10 years now. And what, they're looking, what they see is the, the uh, upper crown of these uh, black walnut trees yellowing and thinning out. And then death um, continues from there. And they see a wilt on it as, and as well. And, and the trees only live about three years after these symptoms appear. Now, tree, this is once again a complex of diseases. And, and one thing that's necessary for this is the walnut twig beetle, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. It's one of those little tiny bark beetle guys, again, that's very hard to see. But it's the attack by the walnut twig beetle uh, that, that starts the canker development and, uh, around their galleries that they cause, that causes the actual death of the trees. And the uh, fungal associate is the Geosmithia species, but there's also a second one that, uh, that, that is so associated with this that causes canker formation on the trunk and branches. In, um, so you get a kind of one, one, two, three punch with this stuff. There is a picture of a bark uh, or I'm sorry, of a walnut twig beetle actually uh, making its way into the bark to oviposit. And the first symptoms are the cankers, which um, you, if you look at the cankers, you'll always see a, a, a hole right in the center of it where that beetle has been active. Now, there are no known treatments for the fungus, and it will eventually kill infected trees. This is a big problem. I, I should, I'm going to backtrack for just a second and say it's been in 15 California counties for several years. Uh, the fungus has been in the states list, and I'm not going to read that to you because I know you can read. But like I said, it was detected in July in Tennessee. Management of thousand cankers disease is tricky. Um, it's kind of in its nascent stage right now. We need to have a better understanding of the biology of the beetle and the fungus before we can really come up with any great uh, improvement on what we're doing already. Um, one of the problems is the beetles themselves are very, very active for a long period during the warm months. And insecticide sprays are going to be difficult to perform because you'd have to do You'd have to do it in several increments. But, but even killing off the, the beetles itself may not solve the problem. Um, what will happen is the, the fungus itself will go on after the adult beetles or, or the other life stages are killed, and thus limiting the effectiveness of the insecticides, <clears throat> unfortunately. So the, the method that's most used to control thousand cankers disease is sanitation, and that means that that as soon as it's detected, those trees are taken down and destroyed. Um, destroying them is tricky into itself because uh, you don't want the, the fungus blowing around. So it's, it's a real problem, one that is of great concern out here in the East Coast and certainly of concern in the West Coast. <clears throat> you can see from this map some of the places that uh, in the West Coast, particularly where this thing has been established by survey, uh, poor Colorado. I, hmm, that's funny. It's not showing up there. This may not be. I apologize if this isn't the right map. But, but anyway, it is established in several states out there. Uh, this new one, of course, Tennessee, which we just found last year east of the Rockies. So it is a major concern. Lot, I see John and Rochelle is saying lots of survey activity planned for 2011. You bet. Uh, this is this is a not only a financial pest, but a environmental one as well. There's a lot of interest from our growers. As I did mention before, um, I do have a sheet prepared that will get you started on your research. If there's one of these um, insects or pathogens that you're really wanting to learn more about, Robin will have that sheet posted on emeraldashboard.info under our EAB University um, 
logo. If you click on that, you'll be able to see that. I don't claim to be an expert on, on most of these organisms, but I do want people out there to be aware of what is out there. Uh, I hope this has made some sense to you. And I hope this has been helpful. And I thank you very much. And I see Robin and, and uh, um, Amy have been trying to uh, keep up with all these wonderful questions I've managed to, to glance over there and, and see. And I do thank the experts out there on this that, uh, that have helped us with this. And if, if there is a question I can answer, I will be happy to do so. And if I can't answer it, I'm going to rely on some of the expertise out there in our audience right now. So, Jody, there was one question um, uh, from Pete. He wanted to know how a native insect from Mexico would be considered an invasive in California. I think that was referring to one of the earlier oh. tests that you were talking about. Well, the, the reason that it's considered that way is because although it's been found in Mexico, or, or it, although we know it exists in Mexico, we've never seen it that far north before. And so the fact that it, that it was moved seemingly suddenly to the north by artificial means, which is probably firewood, um, that's why it's considered invasive. It's certainly in a place it's never been before in all of its history and uh, is, is doing a lot of damage up there, which is kind of the definition of invasives. We have one other question. Hold on just a second. Sure. Um, has any effort been made to regulate crating, dunnage, and et cetera, that kind of stuff that seems to be bringing our pests in, from entering the country? Oh, yeah. There's, there's been several, um, several acts that have been done over the last few years. Um, I think it was 2001 in particular. There's, uh, maybe one of our, our APIS people can chime in on this one, but, but th there's been all kinds of acts that, that help with, uh, there's the heat treating, well, let me let me re regroup my thoughts. One of the things that is required now of all wooden material coming in at the source of the wooden material in the countries where it's coming from is that that there has to be some type of mitigation done. Usually that's done through heat treating and there is a program uh, <clears throat> that is very closely followed by APHIS on heat treating. The, the problem is once again that when you have uh, millions or billions of tons of cargo coming in it's even though best intentions are out there it's very hard to inspect all that's coming in. But yes, there are laws on the books. Uh, there is cooperation among some of our major shippers. Things seemingly got better, but it's offset by the, the constant increase in shipping that goes on. We just have a, a really difficult situation. I think I've mentioned before only 2% of things that come into the U.S. through shipping are even inspected. And that's not because someone's being lax. It's because of the huge amount of things that come in here. Any? I think we're good. Is there any other questions before we um, before we sign off here? If anyone wants to put them in chat, that'd be great. Right, and also if you have a question and you need a, re if I don't know the answer, I will certainly uh, send you a resource that will help you. So, so please feel free to communicate with me directly if you have a question, and and that's at e l l i s j at Purdue p u r d u e dot e d u. I'd be happy to help. Like I said, I really had a good time doing this uh, because I don't really know the southern and the western problems and I think it behooves us all to um, to be aware of each other's pain so so I hope this gave you an introduction into that I can't wait to go back and, and read the chat after this is posted this pr uh, presentation will be posted on emerald dashboard info um, probably knowing Robin probably within an hour or two so if you want to go back and review it uh, please feel free